WCBI News at 10 starts now. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Quentin Smith. We're learning new details about how a man that led law enforcement on a chase through three counties was captured. Three Lamar County, Alabama men held Jacob Kahn down until Lamar County, Alabama deputies arrived at a home on Prospect Road. Monroe County Sheriff Cecil Cantrell says it all started when his deputies tried to stop Kahn at a Hamilton gas station yesterday morning. Now, despite two tires being shot out by deputies, Kahn still managed to lead law enforcement through Caledonia and into Lamar County. Investigators say Kahn then ran into the woods. The men found Khan inside a home they own, which is currently being renovated. The men tell WCBI, Khan tried to escape through a bathroom window, which is also where he tried to rest. The men say it all played out quickly, but thankfully, law enforcement officers were nearby. Since my brother said, hey, stop, I took off running to the police to get help for my brother because, you know, they all said the rumor was he had a gun and he'd been shooting at cops. So I went and got the cops, and then the U.S. Marshals and everybody came running up the hill, and they had him. Now, although Lamar County investigators haven't officially charged Khan as of yet, he could face burglary and theft of property charges. The attorney for the family of a woman killed in a drive-by shooting says the city of Verona and its police chief need to be held accountable for this tragedy. 66-year-old Annie Walton was killed on December 7th as she was sitting at a table in her Palmetto home on County Road 45. One week later, 17-year-old Latavius Betts was arrested and charged with murder. Betts was the suspect in a murder last spring at a Verona car wash, but he was released from jail by Verona Police Chief J.B. Long. Betts was arrested in July for another shooting, but he posted a $50,000 bond and was released. Now, at the time, Justice Court Judge Sadie Holland says she was not informed that Betts was a suspect in the March murder. Now, Walton's family has filed a notice of claim against Verona and Chief Long, which is required before suing a Mississippi government. Attorney Casey Lott says Walton would still be alive today if proper procedure had been followed with Betts. I haven't heard from anyone connected with the city. You know, they should do the right thing and step up and try to resolve this and do right by these people, but that remains to be seen. What we can learn from this case is that the letter of the law should always be followed no matter what. Never take shortcuts and no chief of police, sheriff, or anyone else has any authority to step into the role of a judge and arrange to release a suspect before they've appeared for an initial appearance. Now, Chief Long says Betts was released from jail initially because witnesses did not identify Betts as the alleged gunman. However, Long says witnesses later said Betts was, in fact, the shooter. Lott is now asking for a jury trial in federal court. The city has 90 days to respond before the Walton family files a lawsuit. Well, it is now time to turn our attention over to weather. Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson is standing by with a first look at our forecast. Keith? Quentin, no issues out there right now. We have temperatures cooling down into the 40s in all locations here in our area. 1005 here. Clouds continue to build. Now, notice this. We do have some rain starting to fire up here in Louisiana and Texas. That moisture is coming our way, so we enjoyed a dry day, a dry start to 2019. Temperatures tonight cooling on down into the 40s. Again, we're in the 40s now, so we'll hold steady tonight. Upper 40s to low 50s as we get into tomorrow. With those rain chances on the increase, look at that moisture as it comes on in from the southwest later tonight. So if you venture on out tomorrow, which many folks will, just have the umbrella on standby. Rain chances increase during the day. There you have it. The full forecast coming up. Thanks so much, Keith. We're beginning to see fewer people living here in the Magnolia State. Mississippi's population was on the upswing from 2011 to 2014. However, three of the last four years, the population has actually been on a decline. Courtney Ann Jackson shows us how Mississippi stacks up with other neighboring states. An informal poll of Mississippians may yield a lackluster description on what the state has to offer. Because uh, there's no jobs here, you know, no entertainment. Nothing. We can see that Mississippi could grow if we just get jobs down here that, that will keep the people here. Yeah. We always got to have something that will keep the people here because there's really nothing here. So 
is they, they leave in droves. Mississippi lost more than 3,100 residents between 2017 and 2018. Not as much as the 10,000 plus in Louisiana, but check it out compared to Tennessee's population surge with more than 61,000 new residents. I really wasn't too surprised just generally whenever I first think about it. Tennessee's bigger, has more opportunity, and probably is just a little bit of a nicer area, if I had to guess. <laughs> As I was speaking with folks about these changes, I ran into State Senator Hillman Frazier, who says the legislature needs to address the underlying issues. We to make sure that we have th things in place to uh, grow our economy, to create jobs, and also to track our young people. You look at places like Tennessee, Nashville is booming. Uh, look at Georgia, Atlanta's booming because they're creating jobs and opportunities for young people there. And that's why our people are leaving going to those places like Atlanta, Houston, and other places because they're elect they don't have the opportunities here. The Mississippi Center for Public Policy makes note that this migration trend shows that people are leaving progressive income tax states and moving to income tax free states like Tennessee. Folks I spoke with think it's all the state's challenges combined that have folks eyeing other states. Courtney Ann Jackson, three on your side. A North Mississippi lawmaker says legislators will tackle teacher pay, the opioid crisis, and human trafficking, along with other issues, during the upcoming session. District 19 State Representative Randy Boyd is preparing for his eighth legislative session. The Mantassi Republican believes there will be an action on pay raise for teachers and also some state employees. He also says lawmakers can help toughen laws to make it easier for law enforcement to deal with human trafficking. It's not just a sex trafficking thing. It can be any kind of trafficking. It can be uh, work-related, forced slave labor, or, or that type of thing. And you find that more in, in than you think in Mississippi. Everybody should be concerned about it. shouldn't Shouldn't have any problems. It, you know, the way we address it is the way the rest of the nation's going about it and trying to. Uh, maybe step ahead of some of those things that we've seen in other states and make ours just a little bit better. Boyd also believes lawmakers will look at the mental health crisis by helping some people get treatment for their illnesses instead of jail time. The 2019 session starts on January 8th. Mississippi drivers will be putting a new license plate on their vehicles this year. The state seal, which has the phrase, In God We Trust, is on the design. It will replace the current car tax, which features the guitar of blues legend B.B. King. Now, some critics say the design is unbalanced and the state seal is slightly off-center. The standard state license plate is redesigned every few years, partly as a way of catching people who fail to pay the annual renewal fees. Drivers will receive the new plate when their old one expires and when they pay the fees. The next system is on the way down here in the desert southwest. Churn in there. We can see it with the water vapor imagery. Moisture on the way back. Look at this. Rain chances coming on in as well. Full forecast. Stays. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. Hey, that was Quentin. How are you? All right, let's talk about the weather. Hey, Quentin, do you want to do this? He says it's all me. All right. Okay. I'll try to get him to do it at some point. Uh, that was our Louisville sky cam downtown Louisville, Mississippi today. A gorgeous sunset with some of those clouds coming out. And no rain right there. That's our live Doppler radar. But we've been talking about this and we continue to talk about the potential for one to three inches of rain or more over the next several days here. And that could lead to more flooding. Now, we've already had some wet weather around here. And actually, in Tupelo last year, 71.84 inches of rain, the seventh wettest on record. Starkville, the eighth wettest on record, 68.33. So very wet across parts of our region over the last year or so. Now, Tupelo over the next 24 hours, basically 40s here. We'll get up to around 50 in some spots, uh, but we're going to hedge the bay and go with more in the way of 40s across the northern tier tomorrow. Some of you may not see some rain in the morning for the commute, but rain will build on into the region. Winds from the north at 5 to 10, a shot at 50 in Columbus and some low 50s here in the west Alabama. We can go with a rain chance at 80%, so that means a pretty good likelihood of some rain at some point during the day tomorrow. A big range in temperature across the region, 20s, 30s, and 40s back to the northwest, 60s off to the southeast, and this dividing line right here, 
really won't be changing too much as we go throughout the next three days, but the moisture starts to stream on in later tonight already down there in central Louisiana. Futurecast doing a decent job picking up on things. So uh, tomorrow morning we may have a band of rain somewhere across our region, but that doesn't mean all areas will have rain initially for the morning commute. We do expect though to rain for the rain to build on in as the day goes on and it could actually pick up in intensity uh, tomorrow evening and tomorrow night right here with one little wave of energy that moves on through and then we'll have another wave kick on through to give us some steadier rain Thursday evening, Thursday night into Friday morning. Some lingering showers possible during the second half of our Friday but the wettest part of our Friday could actually be the first half of the day. Some clouds and maybe some fog will linger Saturday morning but notice that clearing back to the northwest and that should build in here as we get into the weekend. You want the winter weather, icing and snow problems back to the west, just west of Dallas and Oklahoma City, but winter weather advisories out there for this system. For us though, we stay warm enough for all rain. Uh, 40s to low 50s for the next few days and then 57 and 63 Saturday and Sunday, Quentin, with a lot more sunshine. Businesses in Starkville were buzzing with Bulldog fans looking for a place to dine in and watch today's bowl game. We visit one of those restaurants when we come back. Welcome back. There were plenty of Mississippi State fans in Tampa today, but not everyone could make the trip to Florida. So, in Starkville, some businesses were busy with hungry Bulldog fans. Our Blair Schaefer stopped by one of those restaurants and has more. It all started out with a question last year. Well, I asked my wife if she was going to cook. She said, no, I'm not going to cook in the house. And I said, well, <clears throat> let's go to the eatery in the research park and we'll cook. Taylor then had another suggestion. And I said, so while we're there, why don't we just open and invite everybody to come have lunch with us? And we did, and it was very successful. The Cake Box Eatery has since moved to a location closer to Mississippi State University on Russell Street. And with MSU football playing in the Outback Bowl around lunchtime, he thought opening his restaurant for local fans would be a good idea. Well, that's the one of the other reasons was the game was on, and that's a good way to watch the game, have people watch it around you and eat and have a good time. So that was that was the plan. This plan brought in many Starkville residents who came for good food and camaraderie. And for Bulldog fans, they filled their bellies while supporting their home team. I love being here on New Year's with this good food and all of our special traditional New Year's foods, especially watching the Bulldogs play and supporting them. It's just a great atmosphere to sit and eat and support the dogs. Some customers also left feeling empowered and ready to take on the new year. But it wasn't the football game that fueled their fire. It was the food. This is just fantastic. You can get your all your New Year's eats in, the black eyed peas, the greens, the pork. You can be covered for the year. It's like I'm wearing armor. That was our Blair Schaefer reporting there. Taylor and his family say they love cooking for locals, and through his food, he hopes to bring people luck, health, and money. Mississippi State and, and Iowa faced off for the first time in history this afternoon. We have highlights from the Outback Bowl coming up next in sports. Your WCBI Sports with Courtney Robb. Plenty of emotions throughout the Outback Bowl today, and it kind of went as follows from excitement to anger to hope and then confusion. Although Mississippi State started with the lead and redeemed it a little bit later, the Bulldogs fell victim to just too many penalties and too many mistakes made. It was the first ever matchup between the Bulldogs and the Hawkeyes earlier today for the 2019 Outback Bowl kicking off the new year early. Nate Stanley swallowed up by Jeffrey Simmons and then Chauncey Rivers for the sack. It would be a field goal fest in the first quarter. The Bulldogs would lead 6-3 in the second. Stanley here on the play action finds a wide open Nick Easley. Off to the races he goes, takes it 75 yards to the house, gets the touchdown. The first play of longer than 50 yards that State has given up all season. Iowa goes into halftime leading. 17 to 6. Different dogs come out after the break. After a Willie Gay interception, Kylan Hill punches one into the end zone. The two point conversion wouldn't be good, and the Bulldogs trail by five. On ensuing kickoff, Amir Smith marks set on the return, gets leveled, fumbles right into the hands of Mark McLaurin, and the Bulldogs are back in business. 
Now the very next play, Nick Fitzgerald going into beast mode, breaks some tackles, puts up his blockers, and goes 33 yards for the touchdown run to give the Bulldogs the lead back. They'd be leading by just two points, 19 to 17. And Iowa would hit right on back resiliency. Fitzgerald, his pass here is going to get tipped at the line of scrimmage. He gets picked off by Chauncey Golston. And then the Hawkeyes capitalize on another turnover. Stanley to easily again from eight yards out. Ira takes back the lead 24 to 19. The Bulldogs working on the comeback. Fitzgerald this time finding a wide open Stephen Gidry, but gets tripped up at the one yard line there. And then after three straight QB runs from the one, Iowa comes up with the goal line stop. State would have to settle for a field goal. And then on the Bulldogs' next possession, Fitzgerald is going to throw it to Osiris Mitchell. And this time, the catch is going to be good. An incredible 30-yard catch. But the Bulldogs, again, not able to capitalize any more on that play. They would have to settle for another field goal. It'd be 24-22 to Iowa. Bulldogs looking for six. Fitzgerald throws to the end zone, but Gidry drops it right into the hands of Jake Gervasi. Another interception. Iowa tacks on another field goal there. And that would pretty much put everything to an end. Iowa wins the Outback Bowl 27 to 22 over Mississippi State. Penalties and turnovers hurting the Bulldogs in the final game of the season. Nick Fitzgerald ends his career with the Bulldogs in emotional fashion. We caught up with Sports Director Tom Ebel, who was there to watch all the action and tell, tells us what went wrong with the Bulldogs today. A disappointing end of the 2018 college football season for Mississippi State. Iowa wins 27 to 22, but rushes for negative 15 yards and at 199 yards of total offense. The killer for the Bulldogs, giving up 17 points off three turnovers and eight penalties compared to zero for Iowa. The Bulldogs talked after the game about how they felt disappointed because they believed they left a lot of plays on the field. It just seemed like uh, any time that we were uh, we're moving the ball, you know, we hurt ourselves. Anytime we're on defense and we get a stop, hurt ourselves with a penalty. Um, so you know, it's just something that is unacceptable on our part. And uh, I guess congratulations to them for being a team with absolute zero penalties in a football game. So good job. I know we're, we're a way better team than that, especially on defense. We've done some things today that were completely out of character, some things that, like, that never happened, especially for me. Busting that coverage, that's something that I've never done in college football. Um, so, man, it's just disappointment. You know, we left a lot of players out there that we want back. At the same time, you know, we, it's accountability. You know, everybody had to be accountable, you know, and the discipline. We got to have a lot of discipline, you know, playing the game of football, you know. And our one of them team, you know, you can't have crazy penalties. You can't have, you know, stupid penalties. And, you know, and that was kind of killed us, you know, um, like twice, you know, we could have got off the field on third and fourth down. You know, I'd feel a lot, a lot better if it was nine and four after today, but, you know, you look at the games, you know, we lost or all the quality opponents. You know, we had opportunities in all of them and, you know, didn't come out on top for different reasons. Uh, you know, but ultimately, you know, won't be satisfied until you're 14-0. And, and, you know, we uh, finished regular season 8-4, won the Egg Bowl. You know, had an opportunity to win our ninth game in the, uh, you know, in the bowl game and, you know, weren't able to finish it off. The most commonly used phrase amongst the Bulldogs after the game, we beat ourselves. That was the feeling of disappointment shared by all the Bulldogs I spoke with after the game. The Bulldogs finishing 8-5 and five in year one under head coach Joe Moorhead, but it has the feeling of what could have been. So many games where it felt like one or two plays made the difference and may be a team where we look back on and say what happened as a roster full of NFL talent moves on to the next level. Reporting here in Tampa, Tom Ebel for WCBI Sports. Courtney, we'll send it back to you in Columbus. Thanks, Tom. A tough loss for State. That's going to be it for sport. We'll have your last look coming up after the break. WCBI Sports exclusive coverage of the Outback Bowl live from Tampa is brought to you by OCH Regional Medical Center, Advanced Medicine Compassionate Care, Bank First, a better way to bank, member FDIC, and visit Columbus, the city that has it all. All right, some more rain coming our way for the next few days. Have a good night, everyone.